we're talking to Eric Phillips, one of the Australia's great polar explorers and expedition leaders. In fact, one of only two Australians to have skied both the North and the South Poles. He describes himself as a bit of an ambassador for the Arctic. Well, he's just back home after a three-month stint circumnavigating most of Greenland on board the Greenpeace vessel MV Arctic Sunrise. Eric Phillips was the safety and survival expert on that scientific expedition, which took a very close-up look at the Arctic meltdown, and he joins us this morning in our breakfast studio. Eric, welcome. Good morning, Fran. Great to be here. Eric, most of us will never get to Greenland, I suspect. Um, 6% of the world's fresh water is locked up there in its ice sheet. Before we get to the sort of science done by your expedition, what is it like up there? What's it like to sail around and have a look? For those that have been to Antarctica, uh, I would say it's like Antarctica. But of course, most of us haven't been to Antarctica. It's uh, a very fascinating um, country, or almost a country now. It's almost independent from Denmark. Um, it's the largest island on Earth, <clears throat> and um, it is, of course, covered in ice, and the ice spills down via these glaciers down into the ocean. It's got fascinating wildlife, uh, wolves and polar bear and fox and wonderful birds, seals, walrus. Um, uh, it's, it's just a, a, an awesome place that is now the centre of uh, some incredible study by scientists around the world. Yes, because by all accounts, some incredible things are, are happening to it. We spoke earlier in the year on this program about the impact impact of uh, climate change on the Lincoln Ice Bridge. Now, you've actually had to be making your way through those areas. What was it like? How difficult was it to pick your way through the ice bridge, um, given there has been some breakup? Well, I'd like to say that it, w it was really difficult to get up to the Lincoln Ice Bridge, but indeed we were completely unhindered. There was no ice at all in this pollinia. A, a, a pollinia is a, is, is a naturally open area of water, and it's naturally open in summer. But typically, um, th there's a lot of ice that's, that's in the, the Nara Strait and the Davis Strait heading up towards the Arctic Ocean. Typically, we would have been hindered by a lot of ice there, but we had clear passage, and we believe that it's the first time that a ship has ever in the month of June or even July um, got up this far. Um, and then what happens is that when the Arctic starts to break up, it then floods down through this strait between Greenland and Ellesmere Island, Greenland and Canada, and, and heads back down again. So we were able to steam up there completely unhindered and nose ourselves into the Arctic pack at, at what is called the, the Lincoln Ice Bridge, which is just an arc of strength and ice between Canada and Greenland. What you can see here is a July 2008 satellite image of Nair Strait, and notice all the sea ice flooding the strait. In this recent July 2009 satellite image, Nair Strait is completely ice-free. In fact, Nair Strait has been open water throughout the winter. It hasn't consolidated. And this all strengthens the case of global warming. Of course, some people dispute that this is, this is what is going on, that this is climate change or this just could be some kind of periodic melt. And I guess there's no real way of knowing that definitively for a while. But you, uh, more than almost anyone, have first-hand witnessed changes up in the Arctic over the last... I think you've been going there every year for the last seven years. Have you seen changes Absolutely. There's, it's, it's unquestionable that things are happening up in Greenland and by and large they're happening faster than we're led to believe. Uh, for seven years or since 2002 I've been skiing to the North Pole um, and I'm seeing changes in that very short period of time. For example, last year was the first time that I'd ever skied for eight, nine, ten days. I take clients on ski expeditions to the North Pole for the first time ever on first year ice. Now what that means is that the previous summer there was very little ice remaining in the Arctic Ocean. And we've heard these predictions from scientists that uh, soon the Arctic Ocean will be completely ice free, perhaps by the year 2030. Um, and suddenly I'm, I'm skiing on only on first year ice. Typically it's Which full means of, it's all melted and that's now this right. is just the... And it's, it's refrozen. Typically we have multi-year ice, which is big and it's gnarly and it's chunky and difficult to get over. So things are changing. And also the gateway town that I use to get to the Arctic, Longyearbyen, which is in Spitsbergen, Svalbard, um, <clears throat> there's a, a lovely fjord outside the town in, of Longyearbyen, which had prior to 2005 had never not frozen in winter. Since 2005, it has never been frozen. So th these changes are happening. These changes you've witnessed with your own eyes, so you can tell the story. What about the scientists you were travelling with? What did they tell you? 
these scientists are, are world-renowned scientists, very established uh, and, and recognized um, organizations, institutes around the world, like the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And um, they're recording pretty scary data up there in Greenland. Um, you know, perched on the Arctic Sunrise, the Greenpeace vessel, they're um, taking uh, pretty amazing measurements. For example, um, oceanographers are now uh, seeing um, tropical waters coming up as far as, uh, as southeast Greenland. Now, these have never been recorded there before. Now, the problem with tropical waters reaching Greenland is that recent discoveries of these scientists is that um, the, this warm water is actually melting the underside of the glaciers 25 times faster than the air is warming the glacier on top. And this is so only a recent jeopardy. discovery. So it's double jeopardy. It's a warmer air climate, but there's also warmer currents coming up from underneath. And it's having a far greater effect than the air is. So... Um, so therefore, bigger and, and, and a greater volume of icebergs are breaking away from these glaciers and floating out into the ocean and melting and therefore decreasing the salinity of the oceans. The NASA's Earth Observatory is predicting more dramatic changes for the Greenland ice sheet in coming decades and centuries. The scientists on the expedition you're a part of, how, how do they try and document these changes? Were they using, were they just measuring water temperatures? Were they using time mass photography? I mean, how, how were, what were they doing? There? A bit of everything. The, the glaciologists, uh, we had one fellow, Dr. Jason Box from uh, Ohio University, and he's a, a, a world-renowned gl uh, gl uh, climatologist. And so he has cameras uh, perched up on the clifftops above these glaciers. He has trackers, iceberg trackers, on both icebergs and the glaciers to measure the speed of travel uh, and, and also to record when these things do break away. So we were up there on the Peterman Glacier in northwest Greenland um, awaiting its, its demise. Uh, an, an area of uh, 120 square kilometres was, uh, was due to break off this year. In the Peterman Glacier? On the Peterman Glacier. This is the largest floating glacier? The largest floating glacier in, in, in the northern hemisphere. And, um, it, I mean, it didn't break away, which is actually great news because we don't want these large islands to break away. Um, so they were using these sort of instruments to, to get their data. And, of course, the, uh, the, the oceanographers, they use CTDs, which is a, a current and temperature and depth profiler that they sink down into the ocean to get their measurements. Uh, acoustic Doppler uh, profilers, uh, a wonderful array of instruments, uh, very expensive, of course, and often hanging by very thin threads off the, off the, the side of the ship, but, but comes back with, um, with very, very accurate data. Was there one single thing you witnessed? in this trip that m alarmed you more about the notion of climate change's impact? Um, it's more a story from a local, and that, uh, that is in the town of Tasilak in the, in the southeast. And um, uh, she had told me that, uh, that the number of polar bears coming into the town had increased markedly over the last few years or so. Uh, typically, they didn't come down this far, in, uh, in Greenland and typically they didn't wander about the rocks like this during that, that time of year. And uh, it, it seems the reason for that is that there's so much less sea ice now, particularly on the eastern side of Greenland, that uh, the polar bears are being forced onto the land to forage and to hunt for food because their platform from which they hunt, which is the sea ice, um, is dwindling. As all the systems change as things change. Okay, Eric, thank you very much for joining us on Breakfast. My pleasure, Frank. That's Eric Phillips. He's the Australian polar explorer and expedition leader, and he's just back from that three-month circumnavigation of most of Greenland on a Greenpeace-sponsored scientific expedition.